In this lesson, we're going to introduce the concepts of microscopy and then also staining and classification of microbes. When we talk about microbes, they are extremely tiny and they're much smaller than what we can typically see with the naked eye. So a dust particle is about as small as what we can actually see. And if you look here on this slide, it's showing us that protozoan parasites, so basically protist, they are typically smaller than what we can see with the naked eye, and then it just gets smaller from there. Because our protists are going to be eukaryotic cells, which tend to be larger cells, but then when we're talking about prokaryotic cells, like bacteria, they're even smaller, and then viruses are going to be yet smaller than that. So when we start to talk about all of these um, very tiny things, we start to measure things in what we call microns. So microns are a small, tiny unit of measure. So let's talk a little bit more about units of measurement that we do use as they apply to microbes. So the system that we tend to use when we're talking about really any type of science is the metric system. The metric system is a decimal system and it's based on units of 10. Um, we're going to be looking at um, distances or lengths, so we're measuring in meters, but we're going to be measuring in fractions of a meter. A meter would be much too large. A meter is um, over a yard in length. So it's really all about the prefixes when we're looking at the metric system. We have a lot of different prefixes. You can see many of them on this slide right here. Um, and so this prefix, deci, means one-tenth. Centi is one one-hundredth milli is one one thousandth but when we start to talk about microbes and measuring microbes we're going yet smaller than that so a micrometer or micrometer micron really those are all referring to the same thing if you look here this is one one millionth of a meter so it is very small and we will measure some microbes as um, micrometers and then sometimes we're even talking about smaller than that and that would be down here, a nanometer, which is one one billionth of a meter. So an extremely small measurement that we're talking about there. So we do focus on the prefixes. Again, um, notice the way that we abbreviate them, the micrometer or micrometer. Um, this is a mu symbol, it's a Greek symbol. So just to write it out a little larger right there, we put that in front of the M. So that means micrometer or micron and the nanometer is going to be in M. If we look at the scale, some different things that we're more familiar with and how they do compare, a human would be maybe one meter or a little over a meter in their actual length. If we were talking about a mouse, um, a mouse is going to be um, less than a meter for sure. So this is, notice this is one tenth of a meter right here if we're looking at 0.1 meters. And so the mouse is even smaller and if we get down to something like an ant, an ant is going to be maybe one centimeter. So one centimeter would be about like this, so pretty small um, that we're talking about there. And then notice we just get smaller and smaller. When we're looking at eukaryotic cells, eukaryotic cells would be cells that you might find in animals. So humans, they might be plant cells. These are typically considered to be big cells. And notice that our big cells are really falling within this range here so these are going to be um, in micrometers so they may be 10 micrometers up to maybe 100 micrometers maybe even a little larger than that and when we get down to parts of those cells so just pieces like the chloroplast then we're getting down to maybe one micrometer um, most bacteria are going to be just a few micrometers in length or microns, again, same thing. Um, let me just write that here, that a micron is the same as a micrometer or micrometer would be another way to say it. If we abbreviate it, that's this unit right here. Virus particles, we're getting down into the nanometer range and you can see on the bottom um, what ranges the human eye can view. Human eye can view um, kind of from about one millimeter up, maybe a little smaller than one millimeter. And then when we get smaller than that, we're getting into the light microscope range. And then even smaller, we're going to have to rely on more powerful methods of microscopy, which are going to be electron microscopes. 
So we will be using a lot of microscopes if we are studying microbes, again, because they're so tiny and the naked eye is not gonna be able to view those. So if we talk more about microscopy and um, what this involves and basic principles of microscopy, um, essentially we're going to be using light or electrons and these are used to ultimately magnify objects so that we're able to actually see them and study them. There are some general principles that apply when we do start to talk about microscopy. These are the principles that our microscopes are really built on. The first one is wavelength of radiation. What we see on this slide is what we call the electromagnetic spectrum of radiation. And so what we're talking about are things that travel in waves. These are forms of energy that travels in waves. And we do have a lot of different types. We can have, um, you can see on the one side, we have gamma rays and X-rays, UV light, and this ranges all the way through what we call visible light, infrared, microwaves, and radio waves. So there's lots of different types of energy that does travel in waves. And the part that's kind of pulled out here that we're looking at more closely is visible light. Visible light has a wavelength that runs from 400 nanometers up to 700 nanometers. So by waves, we're looking at this. Okay, so notice on the bottom how we do have the different waves. Where we're at on this spectrum um, is really dependent on the actual wavelength. So how compressed together that spring is or how stretched out that spring happens to be. When we're measuring wavelengths, if I just draw one up here, so if we're looking at this, the actual wavelength is from the top of one to the top of the next, or what we would call the crest to the crest. That is the wavelength. And there is this correlation between wavelength and the amount of energy that's packed in to these different types of electromagnetic radiation. So as we get smaller over on this end, this is going to be higher energy. So higher energy would be packed into gamma rays and X-rays compared to what we have on the other side, where if we look over here, notice that these are longer wavelengths and longer wavelengths are going to be lower energy. Besides the fact that we have a correlation between wavelength and the amount of energy that's there, there is also a correlation with the resolving power of a microscope. So as we get to shorter wavelengths and higher energy, we're going to have increased, resolu increased resolution. And as we get to the other side, you get to your lower energy, bigger wavelengths, we're going to have less resolution. So ideally, we have really great resolution with our microscopes. So the smaller wavelengths are going to produce better results when we're talking about what we're able to actually view, what we're able to actually see in the microscope. So to sum it up, smaller wavelengths are going to result in enhanced microscopy. So if we can use things that are smaller wavelengths than what we have with visible light, the results are gonna be even better. And we will see that that's really where the usefulness of the electron microscopes comes in. Another important principle of microscopy is magnification. Magnification is the apparent increase in the size of an object. And this increase in the size of an object is based on the fact that a beam of radiation is going to refract when it passes through a lens. So refracting basically means bending. So notice in this image here, the light passes through the lens and as soon as it passes through the glass, it is bent. That bending is the refracting that we're talking about here. And if you look at the bottom image, you can see how this is used with regards to microscopy. Basically, we have light that's passing through the specimen. When it passes through the specimen and the actual um, lens, it's going to be bent. And then that bending is going to be ultimately used to amplify or magnify that object. And you can see that it's much bigger here now when we look at it on the other side of that focal point or on the other side of the lens. So how much is the image actually enlarged? What is that actual size increase? Well, this depends on a number of different characteristics of the microscope that we're actually using. So one of the things that it depends on is the overall thickness of the lens. Um, it also depends on how curved the lens happens to be. And then finally, another very determining characteristic here is going to be the speed of the light or the speed of the electromagnetic um, 
radiation that is actually passing through the substance. So all of those things together will determine exactly how magnified that object actually becomes. Another principle of microscopy is going to be resolution. Resolution is the ability to distinguish objects that are very close together. And modern microscopes, they're able to distinguish things as close as 0.2 microns or 0.2 micrometers. So that's a really small distance that they're able to um, resolve. And we can then view objects um, that are very, very tiny. If we look at this right here, it shows us some of the objects that we can view with typical microscopes. So with the unaided human eye, we can see things that are a little bit smaller than one meter. If we're using light microscopes, and those are going to be the most common microscopes, um, those we can see um, things ranging from, say, one micrometer up to one meter, and really bigger than that if we wanted to. But once we get below one micrometer or one micron, we're going to have to start using fancier microscopes, things such as electron microscopes, but if we're able to use electron microscopes, we can actually see things down to the molecule size and the atom size. But those are going to be um, more elaborate microscopes and they will be more expensive, of course, and they will require special facilities to actually utilize them. So ultimately, the resolution distance is based on the wavelength of the electromagnetic radiation and the ability of the lens to gather the light. So those two characteristics will determine ultimately what we can resolve, which determines how tiny are the objects that we're actually able to view. Contrast is also going to be very important. Contrast is the differences in intensity between two objects or between an object and its background. So we will have to have a certain level of contrast there to make viewing possible. And this is something that is typically improved using a variety of different stains and then also using light that is what we call in phase. So as we go through and we talk about the different types of microscopes, um, we'll talk about what they use for contrasting purposes. We'll talk about the in phase light a little bit more and then what's meant by out of phase light. Okay, so if we talk about different types of microscopes, there are many different categories of them. Um, they do have different abilities to magnify, different abilities to resolve, and that's really based on the different characteristics of the electromagnetic radiation that they're using, whether it's light that's in phase, and so on. So we will go through these characteristics now as we talk about the types of microscopes. Light microscopes are using visible light to examine specimens. And when we're talking about light microscopes, these do get divided into two main categories. We have what are called bright field microscopes, which are gonna be the most common, and then we also have dark field microscopes. So if we talk about the bright field microscopes first, um, bright field microscopes basically illuminate the background, and then we see a darker specimen on top of that background. These fall into two types. We have simple microscopes and we have compound microscopes. The simple microscopes are basically the first microscopes that were invented, and these are not much more than a magnifying glass. These are going to use a single lens, and they are ultimately capable of magnification up to about 300 times magnification. So we can see one here. This is basically what Leeuwenhoek would have been using when he did um, examine the first microbes under a microscope. It was more like this that we see right here. If we look at more elaborate microscopes, um, the compound microscope is really the next step up. The difference with the compound microscope is that now we're using a series of lenses. So that's the compound part of it. We use a series of lenses, and by having a series of lenses, we will be able to have a more enhanced, greater ultimate magnification. So if we look at this picture right here, we have light coming up from the bottom. We have a lens um, right here, so that's one lens. And then we have other lenses um, in our objectives, okay, so we can see those here. And then um, also there tends to be sometimes some in the oculars or the eyepieces. So we see that up here. 
So you've got all these different lenses that will be working together to increase the magnification that we do have. As far as how we calculate that total magnification, we take into account the different lenses that we have. So we have um, basically the objective magnification and we multiply that by the ocular magnification and that's gonna give us a total number um, that we can have for magnification. Now, we sometimes even use some oil on top of the slide to increase the magnification even more. So one of the pictures here, um, this one over here is showing us without using oil, and this one on this side is showing us with oil. Now these are um, special lenses that are designed to be used with oil, so we call it an oil immersion lens, and it has to be very close in distance to the slide or to the specimen. That is a definite requirement in this case. So if you look at without the oil, without the oil we get the bending of the light right here, which means that that light actually escapes and it doesn't make it up through the objective that we're using to view the specimen. If we're able to get more of that light focused and coming through the objective, then we can view even more and we're gonna get greater magnification. So that's what the oil is going to do. The oil is going to prevent the bending and the losing of the light on the sides. Notice how when we add the oil, we have more light coming up through the objective which again is going to increase the ability to magnify. So some uh, microscopes, some objectives are going to use oil to improve the capture of light, which will ultimately improve the magnification of the microscope. So those are our compound microscopes. They are a type of bright field microscope. Again, with bright field microscopes, we're talking about a bright background and then the specimen on top of that. So with these compound light microscopes, we can achieve up to about 2,000 times magnification. So that's definitely enhanced from the simple microscopes, which were about 300 times. So these are the bright field light microscopes. We also have dark field microscopes. And the dark field microscopes are really just kind of flipping everything around because in this case, it's a dark background. Um, so we're going to use what we call a dark field stop and this is going to prevent light from actually getting into the objective. And that means that only the scattered light, which is scattered because of the presence of the specimen, only that scattered light is going to actually enter the objective. So when we view the objects on these, the specimen is light and it is on the dark background, which is where the name dark field microscope comes from. So here's just a look at it. Notice that um, we have this special piece right here, which is going to be used to block light from entering the objective. And then we have light that's being bent off, refracted, um, and then that light that's being refracted due to the specimens present, that's what we're actually going to be viewing. This is really useful when we're looking at small colorless cells. So that would be the primary use for the dark field microscopes.